Hello and welcome to SIVA TV. My name is Naya and I am so happy to be your host today. SIVA TV features educational videos made by student producers all across the Sacramento area. This season, we not only have great videos for you, but we also have behind the scenes opportunities to visit with the student producers. I hope you are as excited as I am. Without further ado, three, two, one, action. Coming up on this episode of SIVA TV, we are going to get some answers to cosmic questions, dive into physics by learning how to build a rocket and an electromagnet, and get in touch with the environmental problem of plastic waste. Stay tuned for all of this on SIVA TV. Here at SIVA TV, we love reaching for the stars. First up, Kenzie and Kaden from Andrew Carnegie Middle School are going to get some cosmic questions answered for us in their detailed documentary. Hi, I'm Kenzie. And I'm Kaden. And, and we, we have, have a lot, lot of questions. questions. I gathered a few topics and chose my favorite ones to research. So today, let's explore the universe. What's the universe made of? Is there an end or a space infinite? And what's at the bottom of a black hole? First, what's the universe made out of? I'm gonna give you four options and five seconds to think about it. Is it fabric, atoms, molecules, or socks? Well, it's not exactly any of them in particular. See, the universe includes all of space and all the matter and energy it contains. So technically, socks is partially correct. Part of the universe is made up of socks, a very, very, very small part, but still, socks are made of matter, and matter is part of the universe. But what I think Caden was trying to get at is atoms. Atoms are the basic components of matter. So, that's our answer then, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. Atoms are the basic components of normal matter, which is only thought to make up 5% of the universe. That's one, that's, that's one twentieth of the universe! Good job, Caden. Yes, it is. But then, what else could it be made out of? Well, that's where it gets tricky. Astronomers and scientists don't exactly know, but the best educated guess is DARK MATTER! Dark matter? Like evil? And DARK ENERGY! Dark matter and energy isn't evil, but it does make up 95% of the universe. So, to answer our first question, the universe is made of about 70% of dark matter, 25% of dark energy, and 5% of normal matter, made of atoms. Which is you, me, socks, and bananas which, weirdly, humans share 50% of their coding DNA with, yeah, your half banana. So is that why the Simpsons are yellow? Wait, we're getting off task. 70% plus 25% plus 5% is 100%, right? Well, if we know what 100% of the universe is made of, then that means the universe has an end, right? Well, that brings us to our next question. Is the universe infinite? Astronomers and scientists don't exactly know, but the farthest any human has made it from Earth is just beyond the moon, around 400,000 kilometers away. That'd take 1.3 seconds to get there at light speed, and the edge of the observable universe is 46.5 billion light years away. The universe is thought to be about 14 billion years old, so we don't know if the light from further out just hasn't reached us yet, but scientists and astronomers believe that there's no end to the universe. But is there an end inside the universe? That leads me to our next and final question. What's inside of a black hole? It's a question we don't yet have the tools to answer. But before we get into that, let's look at how a black hole is formed. <laughs> okay. Once a star has exhaustion from the supply of hydrogen in its core, it is nothing left but helium. Then the outer force created by fusion begins to decrease. Because of this, the star can no longer maintain the equilibrium, and the force of gravity becomes more powerful than the force of internal pressure, and the star begins to collapse into itself. The inner layers of the star start to collapse, which compress the core, furthermore increasing the temperature and the pressure of the star's core. A singularity takes place when a supernova does. If the star has a large enough mass, which is more than 30 times that of our sun, 
it will shrink under its own gravity until it becomes a single one-dimensional point called that's, a singularity. That's it right there. Mm-hmm. So if a star runs out of hydrogen, it can no longer withstand gravity and collapses in itself. And if the star is big enough, it becomes a singularity, aka a black hole. Now, this isn't a scale, but if a super red supergiant, the kind of star that makes a singularity, shrunk down so it would fit into the Pacific Ocean, the core, where all the fusion is taking place, would fit inside a football stadium. Now, once the fusion stops and the core reaches iron, it would implode onto itself until it becomes about the size of a basketball. Then, boom, supernova. This thing represents the singularity and all of the glitter and powder is radiation and materials from inside the star that will be redistributed into the universe. To sum that up, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that a black hole is created by a dying, collapsing, massive star that continues caving in until it forms an infinitely small, infinitely dense point called a singularity. But on such scales, quantum physics probably has something to say too. Except that general relativity and quantum physics have never been the best of friends. For decades, they've withstood all attempts to unify them. However, a recent idea called M-theory may one day explain the unforeseen center of one of the universe's most extreme creations. Well, since we don't know what's inside of a black hole, why can't astronomers just go in and find out? Well, not only are black holes way too far away for humans to reach, even with NASA's current state-of-the-art technology, but the reason they're called black holes is because the gravity is so strong, not even light can escape. So if you jump into one of those, you're not getting out. I still feel like we should try. You know what? If you want to find a black hole, go jump into the center and see what's inside. You do you. Y yes. Okay. It's probably going to take me a while to get there. But do you know how long it takes for a pie to expire? Because I like eating pie on Fridays and I still want to eat a pie. You know, I really shouldn't be encouraging this, but depending on the type of pie, it can last around four days in the fridge or seven months in the freezer with no preservatives. Got it. Well, that's it for now. See, See you, you next time, time scientists! scientists. Thanks for getting us in touch with the cosmos. An exclusive SIVA TV interview was obtained from these fantastic student producers. Me and my friend Kaden, who's working the video with me, we did a bunch of research because we wanted to do something kind of in the theme of like questions in the universe because I've always been interested in space. And then we started researching different questions. We went to the NASA website and took a look at some of the images they found through their telescope. My favorite part was when we uh, popped the balloon full of glitter and did that in slow motion especially since that was like probably what I put the most research into, the supernova, and I found that the most interesting. So I thought doing a visual for that just made it a lot more interesting. We love our student producers here at SIVA TV. Now, how many of us have had to be reminded to turn off the lights? Next up, we travel to Sunrise Elementary School to hear our student producer, Rudra, give us a public service announcement on saving electricity in Turning Off. Turning off. That fan and light are wasting energy since nobody is in the room. Turning off is necessary, so do your part in saving energy. And don't forget to fix that leaky faucet because every drop counts. So don't forget to save energy and save water. Thanks for that important reminder, Rudra. Next up, we will join Ryland and Mykota from Will Rogers Middle School as they show us how to build a rocket. How to build a rocket. First, you will have a string and a cap. You will tie the string around the cap. Then you will have a rubber band. You tie it around the cap too. It should look like this when you're done. After you have a long rubber band and cotton wadding, you will make the cotton wadding into balls and put it into the tube. Soon, you will glue the igniter into the tube and push it in. Then you put the cap on and pull the rubber band all the way through.
We're talking about how model rockets work. These rockets are available at any hobby store. Um, Michael's, Hobby Lobby, Amazon um, is where you could readily find these rocket kits. So in order to uh, be able to launch a rocket, you first have to buy a rocket kit, which is the which is has all the pieces for the actual model rocket. Um, you also need to buy um, uh, motors, uh, rocket motors, and typically when you buy rocket motors, they also come with the igniters. And there's also this other piece called a plug. And so first of all, the motor goes in the bottom of the rocket, and um, there is a what we call a little. Um, igniter that goes inside the bottom of the rocket and that igniter uh, heats up using electricity which is sent from a series of batteries in a little launch controller held by the person launching the rocket and they push the button electricity flows to the wire it heats up the igniter inside the motor and it ignites the propellant that's inside and it shoots out the propellant shoots out the bottom and up goes the rocket Yeah, as long as that light stays on, you're good. So hold it in? Yep. So. Five, four, three, two, one. Fantastic! I want to try that build. As an added bonus for SIVA TV, we have an interview with the student producer. So the process it took to make the video, first I had to ask the science teacher if it was okay and I had to get the rocket first. I sat out of a couple of lunches with my camera and I just videoed me building it and the materials it took and voiceovers. I want them to have fun with it, go to the park, maybe even in your backyard. It was a moment that I won't forget. Thanks to Rylan and Mycota for showing us how to build a rocket. Amazing job. Thank goodness for students at McCaffrey Middle School, where Nat shares a video about the McCaffrey Environmental Club. I joined the Environmental Club because it seemed like a fun little group to go out and um, be in the environment. I joined the Environmental Club so I could learn more about the environment and ways to help it with a group of people that also want to do that. Um, I like getting together as a group and helping and figuring out ways to help the environment. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. Mrs. Hegdahl and I'm Mrs. Mino. So we do science journaling we, and we planted like acorns and different grasses and then planted them out at the Cosumnes River Preserve. We've done community service projects where we have cleaned up trails in preparation for activities. That's so why we've had an amazing group of kids come out every year and um, we just, I could not be having more fun doing the club. Let's go from middle school to high school. As Californians, we are very familiar with our unique climate. It's time to watch an amazing school news segment by Jesse at Rio Linda High School about the rain and the drought. California has been experiencing a historic drought. Climate change has been impacting the rain totals for our state's reservoirs. This water supply is critical for the people and jobs of our state. Even though we've had a lot of rain, we are not out of the drought. Just like it took years to get into the drought, it will take us years to get out of the drought. One solid year of rain will not stop the drought, but of course it does help. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Jason Cummings. What do you think about the water and the drought? The water and the drought, obviously it's a very complex issue, Jesse, but we've had some good rainfall this year, but it's been a little bit of a mystery because a lot of people think, oh, we've had so much rain, we're out of the drought. But in reality, one good year of rain won't end the drought because the drought's been going on for years now. If you think back to our current drought cycle, we're about four years in, but then we had two good years of rain, but then four more years of drought before that. I know it sounds crazy and it's kind of complicated, but I was listening to NPR the other day. They said the last 10 years in California have been the driest 10 years in the last thousand years.
What do you think is causing the drought? Well, without a doubt, all the scientists say climate change is causing the drought because it's not only been in California, it's been occurring in other parts of the world, Africa, Australia, they've all had mega droughts. And then in addition to the droughts, there's been flooding. So just like we had those nine atmospheric rivers in a row earlier in the season that gave us all this 18 plus inches of rain, it's causing flooding and it's just really dynamic and problematic. When do you think the droughts will end? Well, the only way the drought's going to end is if there's rainfall for several years in a row, probably three, four, five years in a row, we have average or above average rainfall so we can collect all the water in our reservoirs and the aquifers. I have also read that the aquifer underneath the San Joaquin Valley has sunk two inches because the water's been all pumped out of it. So just like it took us years to get into the drought, it'll take us years to get out of the drought as well. The drought affects all of us. It's hard to predict and control the weather but we can conserve water to help the problem. Back to you in the studio. Here at CV TV, we love student producers who are dedicated to a cause. Let's continue with environmental issues with a PSA by Jensen from Samuel Jackman Middle School on plastic waste. Every year, we dump over 2.2 billion tons of waste, and 99% of the things are thrown away within six months. It is easy to throw away plastic water bottles, but don't do it because it will harm our environment. Instead, throw them in your recycle bin. Let's listen as Jensen tells us a little bit about the process behind the project. The video is about um, someone drinking water while jogging and they throw it on the ground, but then someone else just picks it up and then puts it in a recycle bin. The skills I picked up on were the camera shots and how to make a good PSA. The challenging part was the wind because it was really windy and the water bottle kept flying away. I want my viewers to learn how to instead throwing a water bottle into a trash can into a recycle bin. Thanks, Jensen. Student producers keep their finger on the pulse of current issues. Truman opened our eyes to the dangers of fentanyl in his timely documentary. Join me in watching this compelling film. Zach Didier was a boy of just 17 when his life was tragically taken by fentanyl. He took uh, what he thought was a prescription pill that uh, someone was selling through a social media app and unfortunately it was not a real prescription pill and it was a counterfeit pill made of fentanyl. And that one pill um, ended his life very quickly in his bedroom. Fentanyl is a powerful synthetic opioid meaning it is a deadly, lab-created painkiller. Fentanyl is very unique in how lethal it is in such small doses. So about five milligrams of fentanyl is a lethal dose. To put that in perspective, a teaspoon has 5,000 milligrams. So literally just a couple of specks of salt um, is, a, is the amount of fentanyl that is lethal. Fentanyl is a cheap alternative for drug dealers to use and they carelessly press it into pills with nothing else except a filler. Those pills are then marketed as prescription drugs that would normally be carefully regulated. There is no uniformity in these drugs, and best case scenario, you take a dud and nothing happens. Worst case, you drop dead. Of all pills bought online, 98% contain fentanyl, and 60% of those are deadly. Fentanyl is posing a huge threat and is the leading cause of death in 18 to 49 year olds. The good news is, people are working to stop this. The Didiers, upon finding out their son had been killed by something they had never heard of before, decided they wanted to take action to help other families. After we put all the pieces together, you know, with the law enforcement um, investigation, I just thought every parent needs to know about this. Zach would want us to share this because there are a lot of people who, who are being deceived. The One Pill Can Kill campaign is another way the spread of this is being stopped. This campaign is designed to inform not just parents, but also students about this deadly drug. The One Pill Can Kill Placer campaign is designed to spread education and awareness to let students and parents know about the dangers of illicit 
fentanyl and how available it is today on our streets. We've spoken at every high school from Forest Hill down to the Sacramento Placer County line here in Placer County. Typically we do two assemblies at each high school that we attend and each one of those assemblies has a typically a thousand students at it. So between our high schools and we started reaching out to some middle schools, we're at approximately 30,000 students that we've spoken to and that have heard our assemblies. After educating so many people about this drug, the Didiers have one message to students everywhere. What is going on now is a, an a evolution of a new danger that did not exist when your parents were your age. Your generation didn't start this problem, but you have in my opinion, the most influential power to make a difference and stop it. So my plea to you in your class is to learn the facts. There are so many amazing resources and to just share it with your friends, your cousins, your, your uh, siblings, with your parents, and then just bring awareness as far and wide as you possibly can. So in conclusion, remember that feeling stressed or anxious is all right. If you are ever feeling uncertain about something, know where you can go to get help. A parent, teacher, doctor, or other trusted adult. Just don't go to social media and never ever buy pills there, even if they look real. It's a somber situation, but we thank you for educating us on this deadly problem. Next up, three students from Gold River Discovery Center, Blake, Raphael, and Jason, We'll share how to construct a black hole. So, you want to make a black hole. Let's be honest, you probably just saw one and said to yourself, Ooh, space thing with some glowing rings and a black center? Well, in that case, this video is for you. is a black hole. You have most likely seen one in movies or in other forms of media, but how can you actually get them? Here's this guy to explain. Okay, black holes are celestial bodies whose gravity is so strong that even light, the fastest thing in the universe, cannot escape it. If you were to get close to a black hole, you would experience the process of, of spaghetti in which your body would stretch so thin that your body would eventually become a line of atoms. Once you pass through the event, the event horizon of a black hole, you cannot escape it. No one knows what's inside a black hole. No one will ever know due to the fact that once you go in one, you can't go back. However, a black hole is not a vacuum. If the sun were to be replaced by a black hole with equal mass, it would be as if the sun was always there, except it would increase in force. Due to this, objects can spiral around a black hole. The heat of this rotation forms an accretion disk, a disk that is extremely hot and bright and forms around the black hole. If the accretion disk gets large enough and hot enough, the black hole is considered a quasar. If a black hole and another black hole go near each other, they'll spiral toward each other. This will take a long time, but as this happens, gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time, span out extremely far. A black hole collision is one of the most powerful collisions in the universe. Also, did you know that black holes can't? Yeah, that's great and all, but how do I make one? This isn't black hole fun facts. I want to make one. So, we want to make a black hole? We need to get a new location, so the FBI won't know. Now, with a new location, we can actually start constructing a black hole. First, we need an object. Any object that is no larger than the human body. Second, we need to figure out the object's Schwarzschild radius. This is the radius at which the object will become a black hole, as long as the mass stays the same. We can figure this out by doing the following equation. Wait, that's not right. Oh yeah, it's the wrong equation. Here's the real one. We need to compress the object to a Schwarzschild radius without changing its mass. We can do this by manipulating very strong gravitational fields to crush the object. Fourth, the object is now a black hole, but you probably can't see it. What gives gravity? Well, if your object is, say, the size of the human body, then the black hole is going to be 10 to the negative 23 centimeters long. That's smaller than the nucleus of an atom. It is also recommended to not go near to space, just in case. And that's it. You've created your very own black hole. 
but it is very small. And it's just a generic one. Want to make a spinning one? Even larger? The size of a star? First, we need to talk about what a quasi star is. You already know what a black hole is, but it's physically impossible for a black hole to be twice the size of the Milky Way in the span of 13 million years. There simply isn't enough time for this to happen. Physics and astrophysicists have been trying to find out how these black holes got so big. Quasi stars are the answer to that. A quasi star is a star that may have existed back then when the universe was still very young. It's a black hole surrounded by tons of gas and energy for it to feel. The black hole cannot eat the star all at once, though, making the star absolutely massive. Such a star will be many times larger than the largest star, Stevenson 218. Back to making a black hole. This was time travel back to when the universe was very young, where quasi stars might have existed. Six, we separate the star exterior from the core. And now, you finally have your very own massive spinning black hole. If you cannot separate the star, just use extremely strong gravitational fields to crush a galaxy. That's it. That wasn't that easy. Anyways, thank you for watching and listening to less than four minutes of teenagers explaining how to create a celestial object. Oh. The field of science is so vast, so we will conclude this episode with a little bit of physics by learning how to build an electromagnet with Michael from McCaffrey Middle School. In the video, I instruct the viewer how to make an electromagnet and I show what supplies you need. You need to know how to get good shots. First, what I did was I made a background for the video, so I had a good, good shot. Uh, so that it wasn't distracting for the viewer to watch, so they could focus on the making process. Uh, the hardest part was getting all the supplies to make the electromagnet and making sure I had good shots. Hello everyone, my name is Michael and today I'm going to be showing you how to make an electromagnet. We all use electromagnets in our day-to-day -day lives, but most of us don't even realize that we're interacting with them on a daily basis. Electromagnets are in motors, computer disks, and loudspeakers. They're in doorbells, refrigerators, and even washing machines. It's easy to make an electromagnet, and the supplies are quite common and easy to find. Maybe even in your garage. Oh. Uh-oh. So this is step one. First, you will need insulated copper wire. It works best than uh, regular copper. Next, you'll need a 9-volt battery. I tape these two together so it's stronger. And you'll also need an iron nail, like this, or like this. Now for step two. Wrap the copper wire around the nail, leaving a few inches of each end of the wire free to attach to the battery later. The more turns of the copper wire around the nail, the stronger the magnet, so make sure you've got a lot of wire. The movement of the electric charge to the wire creates the magnetic field. This is what it should look like. With the nail wrapped, Strip both ends off of the wire so that it will create a good contact with the battery. My 9 volt batteries ran out of power, so I've decided to use two D cell batteries. These work as well, they work just as good. Um, make sure that you have a multimeter to help. You don't have to have one, but it helps with reading uh, how much charge is in your batteries before you make one of these, so it lasts longer. Now, for step four, attach one end of the wire to the positive terminal and one end to the negative terminal. There, I have taped one side of the wire to the negative terminal of the battery. Now, I will attach the wire to the positive terminal of it, and we'll see if this works. Amazing! And if I let go of this, it lets go of the paper clips. Now, let's try it with a bigger nail and a bigger battery. Let's scale this up even larger. That wraps up our episode for today. But don't worry, we have more episodes of SIVA TV coming your way. For more content, check us out on secctv.org or find us on your favorite platform, X, Facebook, Insta, and YouTube. We have it all. My name is Naya, and thank you for joining me on this episode of SIVA TV. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.